This video is for a teaching seminar. It gives a brief introduction to efficient coding in biological vision. You can go to the reference below for a fuller account, which has more examples, mathematical derivations, and references. The background context is the three-stage framework of vision. In coding, attentional selection, and decoding or recognition. Efficient coding applies to the first stage so that the transformed or encoded input is more efficiently represented, like data compression. This is needed because there's too much input dozens of megabytes per second coming from dozens of images captured by the eyes at perhaps one megabyte per image. However, visual system cannot process this much input. For example, the attentional bottleneck is only about 40 bits per second. This means most of the input information has to be deleted later before being recognized. However, before attention selects which information to delete, the encoding stage could represent the input information more efficiently. Therefore, efficient coding is to maximize extracted input information while limiting neural coding cost. For example, to transmit as much information as possible to the brain given the limited channel capacity at the optic nerve from the eyes to the visual cortex. Barlow proposed this principle in the 1950s and 60s. Others have applied this principle to various examples with further mathematical formulations. The encoded information is represented by the responses of the neurons such as the retinal ganglion cells. The encoding transform from the raw input to the eyes to the ganglion cell responses is by the neural receptive fields, which can be called filters in engineering. If these filters or receptive fields are approximately linear transforms, these filters or receptive fields can be described by their properties, such as input selectivities or sensitivities, or by the actual filter functions in engineering terms. We can ask whether these receptive fields can be derived from the principle of efficient coding so that we can ask the question and answer the question of what these receptive fields should be and why. For example, the kinds of questions one can ask are why do retinal ganglion cells have center surround receptive fields and why do they increase in size in dim light? Another question can be what is the optimal distribution of cones on the retina? Or why are some V1 neurons double opponent in space and color whereas retinal ganglion cells are not? Here I'm using the neuroscience terminologies on neural properties. It does not matter if you are unfamiliar with them. They just state that many of the experimental finds in neuroscience can be understood from the efficient coding principles. Two of the questions highlighted here suggest that encoding properties should be a function of the visual input statistics. For example, one statistics is the overall light level of the environment. 
in daylight or nightlight. Another is when the input statistics can be affected by whether the animal has normal or abnormal alignments between the two eyes, whether it is cross-eyed or not. Therefore, efficient coding can predict how neural properties adapt to changes in visual input statistics. Let's illustrate with an example. Ocular coding. Here inputs coming from two eyes. Let SL and SR denote signals from the left eye and right eye respectively. Here S stands for signal. In the brain, inputs from the two eyes are sent to the back of the brain to an area called primary visual cortex or V1 through an intermediate stage LGN. For the moment, we do not need to know what LGN is. The inputs from the two eyes then project to the V1 neurons. For example, let this V1 neuron receive input from both eyes. For the moment, let's say, simplistically, inputs to this V1 neuron are sent from image patches in these two red circles, one in the left eye image and one in the right eye image, identical in location and shape in the respective image. This neuron's output is described as a weighted sum of the input signals from the two eyes. The weights are KL and KR. This pair of numbers, KL and KR, describes the receptive field. For example, if KL and KR are comparable, this is a binocular neuron. If KL is much larger than KR, this is a left eye dominant cell, a monocular neuron. If the Ks are large, or if one of them is large, this neuron has a high neural sensitivity to inputs. When we look at many neurons in V1, we can visualize their ocular dominance properties through an image like this one on the right. This is an image of V1 surface, the surface of the visual cortex. Each point in black or white denotes whether the neurons around that surface location prefer inputs from the left eye or from the right eye. The black and white stripes are called ocular dominance columns. We can ask whether these ocular coding properties in terms of these KLs and KRs for many neurons can be derived and understood from the efficient coding principle. Let's step through the formulation. Input signals, SL and SR, are in fact mixed with input noise, NL and NR, giving the total inputs as signal plus noise. Let's consider two output V1 neurons, O1 and O2, containing both the signals and noise. The coding transform gives each output O as a weighted sum of the input signals and noise, plus a coding noise NO. For example, this is the result for the first output neuron's response, O1. Its weight for the left eye input is K1L. It is the effective neural connection from left eye input to this neuron. Its weight for the right eye input is K1R, the effective neural connection from the right eye input node to this neuron. The noise in O1 contains the weighted sum 
of the input noise and contains the coding noise N01. The coding transform from the two input nodes to the two output nodes is completely described by the four feet forward weights. The four effective neural connections, two to the output neuron one and another two to the output neuron two. This two by two set of weights can be described by a two by two matrix K. The amount of information in each neuron O1 or O2 about the input signals S can be measured by mutual information written as IO1S and IO2S. For example, they could be one byte each. Here, bold fonts denote vectors which have multiple components. For example, vector S has components SL and SR. However, the important quantity is the amount of information about signal S in both neurons. This is the mutual information IOS. Here, both O and S are vectors. For example, both neurons together may contain one and half byte of information about the signal vector S. This one and a half byte is less than the sum of one byte and one byte in individual neurons. This is a general mathematical property. Information in response O1 may overlap with information in response O2. That means O1 and O2 could carry redundant information. For example, even when O1 exclusively receives left eye input and O2 exclusively from the right eye, they can still carry redundant information because the inputs to the two eyes are correlated with each other. Given input in one eye, one can guess very well much of the input in the other eye. So, although each neuron carries one byte of information about input signals, half of that information can be already in the responses of the other neuron. This correlation between inputs to the two eyes is a statistical property of visual inputs. Meanwhile, coding can incur costs, for example, in terms of the firings of the neurons. One measure of the cost is the dynamic ranges or the variances of the neural responses. Here the variance is written in the form when the average neural responses are set to zero so that the responses can go either positive or negative from the zero means. You can see this as measuring each neural response O as relative to its average response. The coding transform K determines the coding cost and determines the extracted information IOS. Typically, more information evokes more cost. For example, when K is larger in magnitude, input sensitivities are higher. More information is extracted, but neurons also respond more strongly, thereby increasing the cost. We can define this objective EK. It is a function of K and balances between cost and information. The parameter lambda is a trade-off scale between cost and benefit. This EK increases with cost and decreases with information. So a good K should make this EK small. 
the K to minimize this EK is the efficient coding transform. It extracts as much information as possible while limiting the cost. For this lecture, I skip the details on how to obtain K as the mathematical solution to this optimization problem. Instead, let me show an intuitive understanding of what this solution is. The K can be constructed by three steps using a recipe. The first step is the correlation. Notice that the cost in each channel, O1 or O2, comes from extracting just the information IO1S or IO2S in that channel. However, information in different channels are typically redundant. So, some cost can be wasted for redundant information. For example, the cost may pay for two bytes of redundant information, but the actual non-redundant information extracted, IOS, may be less. To increase efficiency, we decorrelate between O1 and O2, so that this inequality is replaced by an equality. In this way, when the cost pays for two bytes of information, we get the benefit of two bytes of information, with no redundant information to waste the cost. The second step in the recipe is gain control. This is done individually for each decorrelated channel. It scales K so that we do not increase the cost too much, just for only a little bit of extra information. The third step in the recipe is to multiplex signals in different output channels. This I will explain later. Next, let me illustrate each step in the recipe. First, decorrelation. Let's see the correlation between the inputs from the two eyes. In the scatter plot at the lower right, signal SL from the left eye is plotted against the signal SR from the right eye at the same image location. For example, at the location marked by the two red circles, the image patch is bright in the left eye and in the right eye, and they may correspond to this data point on the scatter plot. It shows that both signal values, SL and SR, are positive and large. At another image location, the image patches are darkish in both eyes, and they may give this data point in the scatter plot. The data points in this plot have an elliptical distribution because SL and SR values are very correlated. For example, the pixel values in the corresponding locations in the two images are typically of the same sign. That means typically they are either both brighter than the mean light level or both dimmer than the mean. The correlation between the two images can be expressed by this correlation matrix. The diagonal elements are self-correlations. The off-diagonal element, R, is the correlation coefficient between the image signals in the two eyes. When the correlation is high, R is non-zero and get close to 1. To decorrelate, we need to transform SL and SR to something else. First, add SL and SR together. We get S+. Plus. This represents ocular summation. 
and also we take the difference between SL and SR to get S minus. This represents ocular opponency. Now these two new channels, one ocular summation and one ocular difference, are decorrelated. This is shown in the correlation matrix below. The off-diagonal elements are zero, meaning no correlation between the summation and difference. In the scatter plot, the summation and difference signals are denoted by the two blue axes. So, the decorrelation transform from SL and SR to S plus and S minus is to rotate the axes by 45 degrees. You can see that the sign of S plus is not correlated with the sign of S minus. For example, if S plus is positive, S minus is equally likely to be positive or negative. S plus has a much larger variance than S minus. This is caused by the binocular correlation. For example, if the two eyes are 100% correlated, the summation signal should be twice as large as the monocular signal, and the difference signal should be zero. If a neuron responds like S+, it behaves like a binocular cell. If a second neuron responds like S-, it will be excited by the left eye input and suppressed by the right eye input. If you like links with eigenvectors and principal components, S plus and S minus are eigenvectors of the original correlation matrix with eigenvalues proportional to 1 plus R and 1 minus R respectively. With decorrelation, although no cost is wasted on redundant information, we find something else undesirable. This is because there is a diminishing return of information as more cost is used. For the small variance S minus channel, paying some cost gains a sizable information. For the larger variance S plus channel, there is more information, but the cost is increased by more than a linear proportion. So in this channel, the cost per unit of information is larger. In fact, this larger cost cancels out the benefit of the cost saved by our decorrelation. This motivates the second step in our recipe, gain control. For better efficiency, compress the S plus signal and amplify the S minus signal using gain factors G plus and G minus so that the signals are distributed spherically. So, we save some cost on the S plus channel without sacrificing too much information. The saved cost can supplement the S minus channel, gaining more information than the sacrificed amount in the S plus channel. Now, not only is no cost wasted on redundant information, but also the cost is used more efficiently. This kind of gain control is called whitening. It gives a smaller gain to a channel having larger signals so that all channels have the same output variance. This strategy is useful when input noise is negligible. Because the S plus channel had a larger variance, so its gain, G+, plus, is smaller. 
The third step in the recipe is multiplexing. This is to mix the gain-controlled signals, G plus S plus, and G minus S minus, by another coordinate rotation. For example, one can do another 45 degree rotation by adding and subtracting the two channels like this. They give rise to these two channels, O1 and O2. In the scatter plot, you can see that O1 and O2 are another two axes rotated from the blue axis for the whitened channels. I will skip the details on why multiplexing by coordinate rotation does not affect coding efficiency in general. But you can see this in our special case here. The whitened signals are already distributed spherically. Another rotation of the axis will not change the decorrelation and will not change the output variances. There can be various reasons why this multiplexing is useful when it does not affect coding efficiency. One reason is to minimize the amount of neural wirings in the brain. We skip these discussions here. Let's examine O1 and O2. Writing S plus and S minus in terms of SL and SR the original signals from the two eyes. We see that O1 prefers the left eye input SL. Its sensitivity to SL is G plus plus G minus. The summation of the two sensitivities to the two decorrelated channels. And its sensitivity to the right eye input SR is the difference of these two sensitivities. Similarly, O2 prefers the right eye input SR. Now we see why the cortex has ocular dominance columns. Putting the three steps in the recipe together, our efficient coding transform K is simply the multiplication of these three linear operations. With our coding output O1 and O2, we can read out our coding transform K. For example, we compare the O1 in our formulation with the O1 from our three-step recipe. The sensitivity to the left eye input is the K1L in the coding transform. The sensitivity to the right eye input is the K1R in the coding transform. The noise in the coding transform has been omitted in our recipe illustration since we used a low noise example for simplicity. In the formal notation, the coding transform is denoted by K. K stands for kernel, an engineering term. In this lecture, I'll continue to use the more meaningful notations G plus and G minus for sensitivities to the ocular summation and ocular difference signals. Later on, I'll also use notation GL for sensitivity to the left eye input and GR for the sensitivity to the right eye input. Let's derive a prediction from this efficient coding and show its experimental test. First, for our decorrelation step, we know that ocular correlation R affects the signal variances in the ocular summation and ocular difference channels. Second, from gain control step, the sensitivities G plus and G minus relate inversely to these signal variances. 
Therefore, correlation R can affect these sensitivities. So, these sensitivities should adapt to the ocular correlation R. For example, increasing R should decrease the ratio G plus over G minus. So if we change to a new visual environment in which ocular correlation is larger than usual, we can decrease this ratio because G plus should decrease and G minus should increase. To test this prediction, we need to do two things. First, we need to expose observers to a new visual environment in which the ocular correlation R is larger than the current environment. We can ask observers to wear 3D goggles and watch binocular inputs on our computer screen. And these inputs have higher ocular correlation than usual. An extreme case is when identical images are shown to the two eyes. This makes the ocular correlation 100%. Second, we need a way to measure the ratio G plus over G minus or measure a change in this ratio. This can be done as follows. Show a flashing weighting to the left eye and another flashing weighting to the right eye. These weightings are shown here we see that the two gratings differ from each other spatially by 90 degrees and differ temporarily also by 90 degrees. With these visual inputs, the ocular summation signal is a drifting grating and the ocular difference signal is also a drifting grating, but they drift in opposite directions. What will the observers see? Drifting down or drifting up? This is an ambiguous perception. For brief drift trials, they may see drifting down in some trials and drifting up in the other trials. The chance of seeing a drift direction should increase or decrease when its input sensitivity increases or decreases. Therefore, adapting to an increased ocular correlation R should reduce the chance of seeing the ocular summation drift. Conversely, adapting to a decreased R should increase this chance. The predictions are experimentally tested. The experiment had an adaptation stage and a testing stage. In adaptation, observers viewed the dichotic images designed to have a particular ocular correlation R. For example, when the two eyes see identical images, the ocular correlation is 100%. When the two eyes see photonegatives of each other, the correlation is minus 100%, much less than usual. These pairs of images were shown one after another, like in the slideshow. Interestingly, a couple of minutes of such an adaptation was enough to alter the efficient coding in the brain. After adaptation, the observer was tested on drift perception. A brief dichotic input of our gratings was viewed, and then the observer reported whether the perceived drift was going up or down. Many testing trials were carried out to measure the probability of seeing drifting up versus drifting down. 
a brief top-up adaptation for about one to two seconds was given before each testing trial. Indeed, the chance of seeing the ocular summation drift was dramatically altered by such an adaptation, just as predicted. So far, we have assumed that input noise is negligible. In such a case, the gain control is widening. So the gain for the ocular difference channel S- minus is larger because this channel has weaker signals. When the input noise is not negligible, the gain control is no longer whitening. Now the distribution of visual inputs looks like this. The input includes both the signal and the noise. Here is the distribution of the signals alone and the distribution of the noise alone. Together they make up the distribution of the input. The signals have an elliptical distribution because of the ocular correlation. The noise in the two eyes are not correlated with each other. So the noise has a spherical distribution. Consequently, the shape of the total input distribution is not as elliptical as in the noise-free case. In this example, the ocular difference signal is weaker than the noise in the same dimension. So, if we give a high gain to this ocular difference channel, it transmits mostly noise and, at the same time, consumes cost by making the neurons respond. Therefore, the gain control should be such that the gain G- minus on the weak ocular difference channel is smaller to avoid wasting too much cost on transmitting mostly noise. So, mainly the ocular summation signal is encoded. The ocular difference signal is largely abandoned and the outputs have an elliptical distribution, not a spherical distribution. The outputs O1 and O2 are now correlated with each other because both of them are dictated by the ocular summation signal. Both neurons, O1 and O2, behave like binocular neurons. For example, when G- is 0 0.1 and G plus is 1, each neuron is excited by inputs from both eyes with roughly equal weights. Therefore, in general, when noise is substantial, efficient coding can give correlated neural responses. This is observed in physiological experiments. In fact, correlation in neural responses helps to recover the embedded signal from noise. We recall that when noise is negligible, the two neurons O1 and O2 are monocular cells. For example, when G- is 1 and G- plus is smaller, let's say half, O1 prefers left eye input and is slightly suppressed by the right eye input and O2 has it the other way around. Summarizing When the noise is small, efficient coding amplifies ocular contrast relative to ocular summation. Neurons are more monocular-like. When noise is too strong, efficient coding downplays or abandons 
the ocular contrast in favor of ocular summation. Neurons are more binocular. So we predict that neurons become more binocular as noise increases or after moving to a dimmer environment. We can see that these make sense. Contrast enhancement when the signal is good and average out the noise by summation when the noise is too much. This can be generalized to spatial coding by an analogy. Simply by replacing terms ocular contrast and ocular summation by spatial contrast and spatial summation. Then the analogous prediction is as noise increases, neural recidive fields extract less spatial contrast and more spatial summation. This is done by changing the shape and size of the recidive fields as follows. When noise is small, the spatial recidive field or the spatial filter for visual inputs have this center surround shape. This neuron will be excited by central inputs and suppressed by surrounding inputs. Or it takes the difference or contrast between the center inputs and the nearby surround inputs. When the noise is substantial, such as in a dimmer environment, the recidive field size becomes bigger, mainly by expanding the center and reducing the surround. This shape is good at summing the visual inputs spatially and smoothing out or averaging out the noise. Dark adaptation of the recidive fields like this has previously been observed physiologically. Here, I skip the details on how this can be more rigorously derived from efficient coding. A related prediction is V1 neurons tuned to horizontal orientations are more likely binocular than those tuned to vertical orientation. This is because ocular correlation R is larger for horizontal than vertical inputs. Because our two eyes are horizontally displaced from each other and vertically aligned. For example, in this pair of stereo images, the average light levels are more similar to each other in these two horizontal stripes at corresponding locations than inputs in these two vertical stripes. These are just examples indicating more ocular correlations between horizontal stripes in the two eyes. Therefore, in horizontal stripes, ocular difference signal is weaker. Therefore, input signal to noise is smaller for ocular contrast in neurons with horizontal recidive fields. So this input channel is abandoned more readily, making these cells more likely binocular. This prediction is consistent with physiological data collected from 136 V1 neurons in cats. The number of V1 neurons for each category of ocular balance, monocular or binocular, is plotted here. These neurons are divided into two groups. One group, plotted by red bars, contains neurons which prefer orientations closer to horizontal, and the other group has the other neurons. Data bars closer to the right are for more binocular neurons. We can extend 
the ocular coating from mere ocular weights, GL and GR for the two eyes, to respective residue fields for the two eyes. For example, for our O1 neuron, including spatial residue fields, leads to this result with spatial variable x. The original weight, g plus, is now a spatial residue field, g plus x, a function of space x. The original input, s plus, the summation signal, is now a spatial image of ocular summation as a function of s. Similarly, we have the residue field g minus x for the ocular difference image s minus x. For example, the residue field g plus x in one dimensional space may look like this, and the residue field g minus x may look like this. They can have different sensitivities by having different amplitudes and can have different shapes. In this example, the sensitivity for G minus is higher, so ocular contrast is relatively amplified. Now we can also look at the residue field for the left eye input. This residue field is built from adding the residue field for the summation image and that for the difference image. Similarly, the residue field for the right eye input is built from a difference between the residue fields for the summation and difference images respectively. Consequently, we have in this red curve the residue field GLX for the left eye input and in this blue curve the residue field GRX for the right eye input. These two residue fields have different shapes. In particular, they have different peak locations which are the preferred spatial locations in the left and right eye images respectively. So, the neuron having these residue fields prefer slightly different locations in the two eyes. This neuron is said to be tuned to a non-zero spatial disparity. The primary visual cortex has various disparity tuned neurons tuned to various disparities and they are useful for seeing visual objects at different distances or depth. However, in a dimmer environment or when the signal to noise is lower, G minus X residue field should be much less sensitive, that means its amplitude is relatively smaller. In such a case, the residue fields for the two eyes are dictated by the summation residue field alone. So the two eyes have very similar residue fields, regardless of the shapes of the residue fields for the summation and difference images. This neuron is tuned to near zero disparity. This means in dim light, when fewer neurons are tuned to non-zero disparities, it will be more difficult to sense depth. Indeed, our stereo depth acuity is worse in dim environment. In a primary visual cortex, some neurons have larger residue fields and some neurons have smaller residue fields. With smaller residue fields, input signal is also weaker. Therefore, these neurons 
are also more likely to be tuned to near zero disparity and they have very similar residue fields for the two eyes. This is indeed the case physiologically. This lecture is a very brief introduction to efficient coding. Ocular coding is just an example to demonstrate how coding depends on input statistics and how we can understand and predict experimental data from a theoretical principle. Given the time constraint of a single lecture, I omitted many analysis and derivations and instead used just the intuition and analogies in many instances to make various links. As we mentioned, there are many other questions we can ask and answer through efficient coding. And these materials and various other details can be found in this book.